Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a distinct honor for me to be in your presence. Part of the military training that I did at Fort Knox was after I was a platoon leader, I ended up teaching a top secret course on the comparison of Soviet and U.S. tanks. So if you're interested in that, I have, I have some good news and bad news. The good news is I can tell you anything you want to know about tanks. The bad news is I have to kill you after I tell you. <laughs> As was mentioned, I have been a pastor in three foreign countries, the Netherlands, Canada, and Southern California. And as the son of the South, it really is unusual to have spent the last almost two decades of my life here in Southern California. I thoroughly enjoy it. Do we have any Southerners here? One? <laughs> well, I'll give you one tip. If you ever go back to the South, you can say anything you want to say about anybody as long as you qualify it. That Bubba, he is such a jerk, ain't he? Bless his heart. <laughs> That's all you have to say is bless his heart and you're in. All right, if you will open your iPads, iPhones, Bibles, whatever you have, to Romans chapter 1, please. And I'm going to read with you the first 17 verses of Romans 1. This is the very inerrant, infallible Word of God to the Church of Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also, you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Thus ends the reading of God's inerrant and infallible word. May the Holy Spirit bless it to our use and to our application. The Reformation was a time where there was a rediscovery of many, many things. There were the so-called solas of the Reformation. The first sola was sola scriptura, back to the Bible alone. There was sola fide, only by faith. Sola gratia, only by grace. Solo Christo, only faith in Christ. And soli Deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. It was men like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Heinrich Bullinger, Philip Melanchthon, Martin Bootser, and a host of others 
who were used by God to bring us back to these particular truths. We began this morning with a song by Martin Luther. Let me give you a quote by Martin Luther that has to do with the way he looked at the Word of God. If you have never read the table talk of Martin Luther, you should. Just don't read it with children around. He was very earthy at times. In one of his earthy sayings, he was asked by his students one day, how effective is the Word of God? How true is the Word of God? And I don't know how long Martin Luther thought about his answer, but he said this, if the Lord told me to go out here in the fields behind the church in Wittenberg and pick up a handful of cow manure and eat it, I'd not only do it, I would know that it was good for me. Fortunately, <laughs> we have not been asked to do that. His point, though, was well taken, and it made a profound impact upon his students. The Word of God is so true in all that it says that even if it cuts against the grain, even if you and I don't see that proverbial light at the end of the, the tunnel when God tells us to do something, we are to do it because God loves us and because God's grace is not only sufficient for us, but he only wants the best for us. So whatever he tells us to do, whatever he tells us to be, is good for us. The psalmist wrote about that in Psalm 119, verse 68, didn't he? God is good, and what he does is good. Paul picked up on that theme in Romans chapter 8, didn't he? For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Can that be true? I tell you from experience and from exegesis that it is true. In 1980, the Lord called me to take the casket of my four-month-old son and put it into the ground as my last earthly duty as his father. And I recall going back to our home in the Netherlands, to the little village of Kampen, and literally just falling back on the bed and wiping the tears from my eyes, and that verse came to my mind, and I said, this too, Lord, and he said, yes, this too. This will mold you and shape you into a better person, a better Christian. This will conform you more to the image of Christ. You will be able to comfort others with the comfort with which I am going to comfort you. What I want to do in the time that we have together this morning is to walk us through one of the Reformed documents that is based on Scripture that came out of the time of the Reformation. It came out of an area known as the Palatinate in Germany. And in the Palatinate, the Reformers there were surrounded by Lutherans, and there were some differences between Lutheran and Reformed theology. And two primary authors, Olavianus and Ursinus, put together a document that has come down to us as the Heidelberg Catechism. Everybody probably has heard of the Heidelberg Catechism. What you may not know is that you know there is a larger catechism. The larger catechism has the same question and answer to begin, but it begins by answering all of the questions from the doctrine of God's covenant grace to his people. What is that opening question? Well, in the shorter catechism, it reads this way. What is your only comfort in life and in death. You could emphasize that question a number of ways, couldn't you? You could make that a very personal question. What is your only comfort in life and death? So the question is quite personal. You could also say it's a very exclusive question. What is your only comfort in life and in death. When push comes to shove, when the rubber meets the road, what is it that is your only exclusive comfort in life and death? It's personal, it's exclusive, 
but it's also expansive, isn't it? What is your only comfort in life and in death? As young as you are, you probably don't spend much time thinking about death. There is something that goes with youth that's an element of indestructibility. You don't believe that you will die soon. But none of us knows how many days we have. How we are to number them aright is very important. And so this question sets the stage for the rest of what the reformers were going to be talking about. Because they were concerned not merely with going back and learning doctrine upon doctrine upon doctrine, but they were also concerned with the balance between doctrine and life. Now, it may very well be that you have a low view of doctrine. I hope not, because everyone has a view of doctrine. In that corpus of writings known as the pastoral epistles, and that's letters, epistles. I had a woman, I, I made a comment at a conference one time, I said, just for your information, the epistles were not the wives of the apostles. <laughs> and a dear lady came up to me afterwards and said, then whose wives were they? <laughs> In the pastoral epistles, first and second Timothy and Titus, you will find the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit using a word there, sound. Sound words, sound teaching, sound doctrine. The word sound that we find in the pastorals is the word from which we derive our English word hygienic. Biblical truth, doctrine, is spiritually hygienic. I have a dear friend, a man I am privileged to call a friend and a colleague who is a retired ethicist from the Netherlands. And he made this statement in one of his books. Dogmatics without ethics is empty. Ethics without dogmatics is blind. Now maybe dogmatics is an, uh, an everyday name. Is everybody aware of what dogmatics actually is? That's an automatic transmission on a dog. Uh, <laughs> But, but here's, what, here's what I find a lot in modern evangelicalism. People are coming up to me and they'll say, Pastor Ron, we are looking for something that is practical. We want something we can get our hands on, get our, our minds around. We want practical Christian living. Let's change the words then. Let's take dogmatics and let's supplant that with the words biblical truth. And then let's take ethics and we'll, let's say that's practical Christian living. Biblical truth without practical Christian living is empty. Practical Christian living without biblical truth is blind. It's subjectivism. It's whatever my preference happens to be. And that's where we find ourselves in much of modern Christianity today. When we begin to read the statistics about the behaviors among Christian marriages or among Christian young people like yourselves, what is it that we discover? We discover that people are living preferentially. And one of the reasons they're living preferentially is because of a lack of knowledge of the Word of God. A few years ago, I was doing a conference in Canada. And the topic that I was assigned was the holiness of God. And I could tell as I gave my talk that there was a dear lady at the back of the church where I was speaking that was very exercised. And typically when you finish something like that, a few people will come up, they want to ask you questions. I know you'll all want to come and meet me and get my autograph after this is over. 
But I was standing around with a few of the, the participants in the conference, and I saw that dear lady make a beeline from the back of the church right to where I was. And she pushed everybody aside, and she put her finger in my face, and she said, young man, I took that as a compliment. <laughs> she said, young man, my God is only a God of love. Do you ever have those times when it's the next day and you're in the shower and you go, I should have said that. Oh, that would have been perfect. <laughs> but this was a very special day because I had a lucid interval. And in that lucid interval, I looked at the dear lady and I said, with all due respect, ma'am, your God is an idol because your God is not the God of Scripture. We are in a crisis time concerning the nature and the character of God. And that is one of the driving forces of the Reformation, bringing us back to God, bringing us back to biblical worship, bringing us back to how we are to live and what we are to do. How did they answer that question? What's your only comfort in life and death? Here's the answer, that with body and soul, both in life and death, I am not my own, but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied, fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power and the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Some of us make it easier for God than others. <laughs> Indeed, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. There was a document that came out of the period of the Reformation concerning the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And in that document, and I'm going to paraphrase it here for you somewhat, it says this, God will either prevent all evil from coming into my life or, or if he permits it, he will use it for my salvation. Is it really the end of the semester here? Getting close to, no, it's not. It's, it, but you're stressed. How many people are stressed? A lot of them. How many people are worried? Put your hands down, worry's a sin. Uh, <laughs> you know what stress is? Stress is standing 25 meters from a Muslim ter terrorist who has an RPG aimed at you. Stress is sleeping under tanks for two weeks and eating only meals ready to eat, which the army affectionately calls three lies in one. <laughs> Stress is driving halfway across the country on a quarter of a tank of gas. This isn't stress. This is a great time in your life. It's a time to enjoy and to glorify God and to understand that all of this, what you're going through right now, the, the, the late nights, the study, the cramming, everything else you do is subservient to your salvation. And then he goes on and he says, indeed, that all things are subservient to my salvation Wherefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready to live for him. Now, here's the sequel to that. Question and answer two reads this way. How many things are necessary for you to, to know that you in this comfort may live and die happily? That's a very practical question, isn't it? First, they ask the personal question, the exclusive question, the expansive question, and then they say, well, how do you do that? There's the practical aspect. There's the practical application you're looking for. How many things do you need to know? And they keep it really simple. Three. You need to know three things to do that. How easy is that? What's the first thing I need to know? The first thing I need to know is how great my sins and my misery are. We're living in almost an unprecedented time where in ecclesiastical settings, the word, the S word, 
is avoided like the plague. It's supposed to destroy our self-esteem. And so pastors will not use the word sin anymore. If you have your iPad, or you have your iTouch, or you have your notebook, write this down. You will never, you will never understand God's grace until you understand your sin. Until you come to some concept of the depth of your sin and your depravity, how it offends God and His holiness, you will never understand the graciousness of grace, the loveliness of grace, the sweetness of grace, the beauty of grace. I need to know that. And I don't need to know it once. And I don't need to know it twice. I need to know it every day. What's the second thing I need? Well, once I come to an understanding of my sins and my misery, I need to know how I'm delivered. I need to know how I am saved. And that's what the reformers wanted to teach. And thirdly, I need to know how to be thankful. A life that is a reflection of thanksgiving to the true and the living God. I need to know those things. The first question and answer says, I have to receive these things by faith. What is that? What is faith? I was teaching for Dr. R.C. Sproul in Orlando in January of this year. And I was getting ready to wing my way back to Southern California, and I had a hop from Orlando to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta on to Southern Cal, to John Wayne. And I got on the plane. It was one of those days where they tell you when you get on, it's going to be a very full flight. There's not going to be room for anything. And I was sitting near the back of the plane, and there were two seats empty beside me. And I thought, well, this is going to be fairly tolerable because the flights that go in from Atlanta to Orlando are primarily for Disney World. You have not lived until you have been on a plane with kids who have been to Disney World for a week and have been fed chocolate and ice cream, and they're all wound up. And anyway, so these two young, dear young ladies came and sat beside me, and they sat down, and I'm one of the people that I, I tend to like to write on the airplane, so I, I, I get a book out and a pad of paper, which is a sign. I can't say, leave me alone, but this is the easiest way to say, leave me alone. And so I'm sitting reading, and these two young girls come in, they sit down, and the young girl was all animated. She looked at me, she says, oh, what are you reading? I said, well, I think I'll end this one right now. I said, it was a thick volume by a friend of mine named Robert Lethem on the Holy Trinity. And I said, I'm reading a book called The Holy Trinity on, in history and in the scriptures, thinking that'll, that'll do it. She said, oh, how interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and she was delighted to tell me that she had just been to a conference, a youth conference, and she had been to all these seminars and she, was, she said to me, why were you here? And I said, I was teaching a doctor of ministry course. And she said, well, you must know this guy. And I didn't. My conscience was smitten. I probably should have. And then she said, well, how about this guy? I said, no, I, didn't, I don't know him either. And she said, well, I thought you were a theologian. I said, so did I until I got on the plane. But <laughs> <laughs> so I asked her, I said, did you ever have anything about catechism? And she said, no, what's that? She said, isn't that Roman Catholic? I said, no, actually it isn't. The Roman Catholics copied it because the reformers started it. And she didn't know who the reformers were either, so we spent some time doing that. And she said, well, what's the advantage of something like that? I said, well, let me ask you this. What is sin? And she went on and on and on for about 10 minutes, and she was dancing around the issue. If she had been wearing wet clothes, she would have been dry because she was spinning so much. And... <laughs> I said, how about this? Sin is any want of conformity to the law of God. Oh, that's great, she said. <laughs> I'll take that. This is the advantage of a catechism. 
And that's why the reformers put catechisms together. Every one of them wrote them. I'm from the Presbyterian tradition. The Presbyterian tradition is founded in the Westminster Assembly. And in the Westminster Assembly, the divines from Scotland and Ireland and England came together to put together these standards. And every one of the pastors that was there had written and taught his own catechism for at least a decade. And so they put these catechisms together to help us. They answer our questions so that we can move on and get a handle on this. And it's great not only for children, but it's also great for adults. One of the first things that John Calvin did in Geneva when he returned was in 1541. He wrote an article outlining the worship services. And in those worship services, every afternoon, every Sunday afternoon, was catechism for the children because they had just come out of the dark ages, really spiritually. They had come out of time, out of a time when no one knew or understood Scripture. Isn't it amazing today that we live in an almost unprecedented time in terms of the elemental, fundamental, rudimentary principles of Scripture, and at least they had an excuse, didn't they? They didn't have Bibles in their homes. The worship services were in Latin. Today, we have translations and paraphrases for everyone and about everything. And yet, we still are ignorant of many of the basic truths of God. And so we need to know, what is faith? If I'm supposed to have faith, what is it? Well, the catechism gives us two very easy answers. What is true faith? And it says this, true faith is not only a sure knowledge whereby I hold for true all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also it's a firm confidence which the Holy Spirit works in my heart by the gospel. May I translate that for you? That's a rhetorical question because I'm going to anyway. In order to be a Christian, you have to have something here. You must know the objective truth that God has taught us in his word. You must have sure knowledge. But the reformers understood that there was a problem if you stopped there. There was a problem if you did not take this a step farther because there was a next necessary step that had to take place. What was that? It also had to be a firm confidence. Do you see the God-given genius in this? What's here in my head must filter to my heart. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it must be appropriated. In 1618, 1619, after the time of the Reformation, there was a meeting of pastors and scholars in the Dutch city of Dordrecht. That's why you say that, Dordrecht. It's like Vincent van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh's name is not van Gogh. His name is van Gogh. I was walking in Amsterdam one day and cleared my throat, and the guy said, it's, all right. it's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> It has to be the head, and then it has to filter into our heart. The Holy Spirit has to appropriate it. And what happened at the Synod of Dort when they talked about how is man made to be regenerate? There was a great answer. And it dispelled the answer that presbos and reformed people don't make decisions for the Lord Jesus Christ. That they don't say, I, I choose to be a believer. And here's what it says. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. It says that in regeneration, in that wonderful work where the Holy Spirit comes into the life of an individual, he comes into that life and he works upon the will of man in a twofold manner. What is that twofold manner? He does it powerfully 
because of the reality of sin and the necessity of having to have a powerful work to eradicate that heart of sin, he does it powerfully and he does it pleasantly. Pleasantly. I became a Christian when I was 25, after the Citadel and after my time in the Army. I literally went one evening, no bells, no whistles, no lightning, but I literally went one evening from hating God with every fiber of my soul, one minute, to wanting Jesus Christ as my Savior more than life itself the next minute, powerfully yet pleasantly. I did not go kicking and screaming into the kingdom. I was wooed by love to come into that kingdom. Once that has happened, the authors went on to say, once that has happened, the will of man that's inclined toward evil is now inclined toward good. And that will, acted upon by the Holy Spirit, now acts. And it acts in a way that I receive that which before was repugnant to me. And so it is with our life of faith. Now I want to, in just a few minutes that we have remaining, I want to go to one of the key issues of the time of the Reformation, which is the issue of justification by faith. I read to you this morning from Romans, the very end of chapter 1, verse 17 is, the righteous shall live by faith. One of the great rediscoveries by Martin Luther. That was a phrase that drove Luther, Luther crazy. He would go, and when he was an Augustinian monk, he would go into the confessional booth where most of the monks were going in and spending a couple of minutes and coming out. Luther would go in and he would stay an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And he would come out of the booth and his father confessor would say to him, Brother Martinez, it's okay. You can serve God. It's okay. You don't have to stay that long in the confessional booth. You just need to love God. And Luther's response was, love him. I hate him. Why did he say that? He understood as an Old Testament scholar, and that's what Luther was, he understood the commandments of God. It was only when Luther came to the realization that the righteousness that God required was not a righteousness that you and I work for or can obtain in any way whatsoever. It is a righteousness that God gives to us. And that was one of the key principal rediscoveries of the time of the Reformation. That the righteousness that we have is the robe of Christ's satisfaction and holiness and righteousness with which we are clothed. How does that work itself out practically? It works itself out practically this way. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, but if you are a Christian, God will never love you more than he loves you right now. He will never love you more than he loves you this very moment. If you are in Christ, if you are engrafted into your Savior, God will always love you. Come back to Luther. Luther was talking to his students one day, and these are the, this is the type of thing that students love to hear. He said to his students, you can do, as a Christian, you can do whatever you please. And they said, really? That sounded like the best news they had heard in a while. He said, absolutely. You can do whatever you please as a Christian. And then he paused for a moment, and he said, what pleases you? What pleases you other than pleasing God? 
showing your thankfulness to the one who has saved you, to the one who loves you. What pleases you more than that? Well, as the catechism comes to this question about how is it that we are righteous before God? How is it you and I are righteous before God? They answer it this way. How am I righteous before God? Only by a true faith in Jesus Christ. Only by my head, only by my heart in Jesus Christ. And then they put this in. That is, though my conscience accuse me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have kept none of them and am still inclined to all evil, yet God. That is an amazing hinge right there. My conscience accuses me that not only have I sinned against the commandments, I have grievously sinned against the commandments. How many of them? All of them. And I'm still inclined to all evil. I've never kept one of them. Yet God, without any merit of mine, out of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. How does he do that? As if I had never had nor committed any sin, and myself had accomplished all the obedience which Christ has rendered for me. For those of you who are in cultural studies, <clears throat> there is a radical feminist whose name is Camille Paglia. And Camille Paglia has written a book that was aimed probably at my particular church tradition, at the Presbyterians, and at Dr. Boersma's as well. It's called, and you're, this is the real title, so I'm not making this up, The Joy of Presbyterian Sex. And in that, she makes the point about Protestants. So we're looking at the Protestant contingent. And he, she said, I don't know why it is that Protestants are ashamed of their heritage, that they're ashamed of their creeds and their confessions, because, she went on to say, Protestants have the majesty of history on their side. What we have in this brief time that we've been together this morning has just been a brief outline of the majesty of history that God has given us. He's given us his word. No one will ever supplant the word. The word of God is so simple, a child can pick it up and understand the basic message, and the greatest scholar in the world can never plumb the depths of it. It is God's word. And as such, he has given us a history, and in that history, we have reformed creeds and confessions. And in those reformed creeds and confessions, they help us to understand the great biblical truth of how you and I are righteous before a totally holy God. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.